Well, we welcome you men this morning, and you all look bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. I trust you've all had a good night of rest and come with a preparedness to gird up the loins of your mind as together we seek to think biblically and sanely as we enter into this subject of pastoral counseling. Once again, as we've done at each session, let's cry to God for his help and presence to be our portion. Let's pray together. All glorious, almighty, sovereign, creator and sustainer of all that is, we, your pathetically weak, poor and sinful creatures, would be bold to draw near to you this morning because you in your word have said, let us draw near to the throne of grace. And yet we acknowledge we dare not draw near in an unmediated approach for you have also said, having then a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. And so we fix the gaze of our souls upon him who in his present state of power and glory sits at your right hand. And we ask that for his name's sake, you will as it were look afresh upon him and beholding us in him and seeing and regarding us as fully righteous in him with his own righteousness, that you will hear us in our approach to you. We plead with you once again on the threshold of another day that you would give to us richly and liberally. You are the God who delights to give good gifts to your children. Give us then the good gifts of the Spirit's illumination, of discernment, of insight, of understanding, of holy wisdom, especially as we move into this subject of pastoral counseling where there is such confusion and such a cacophony of voices being raised up, calling us into this path and that path and another path, Lord, with the psalmist, we want to say and demonstrate as we think together that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our pathway. Help me to be sure-footed in handling the scriptures, in handling the stuff of general revelation. Father, be our portion. We feel very keenly our deep need and together we call upon you, meet us in our need, to the end that when we conclude this session and the sessions of this day, our hearts may run out with unfeigned praise and gratitude and with a fresh sense of saying with the psalmist, I love the Lord because he has attended to my supplication and to my prayers. Hear us then, our Father, as together we plead with one mind and heart for this blessing from your hand, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, at last, the addendum to unit number seven is complete, and we now move on to unit number eight, in our pastoral theology lectures entitled, if we were to give it a title consistent with the rest of the lectures, The Work of Pastoral Counseling by the Man of God in the Pastoral Office. And as we enter upon our studies in this vast and complex, complex subject of what is commonly called pastoral counseling, there are four issues I propose to address by way of a rather lengthy introduction. As we enter upon our studies of the subject, it is crucial that first of all, we consider what I am calling an attempt at a definition. 
Many people mean many different things when they use the terminology pastoral counseling. However, when the term is used by me in this course of lectures, I have a very specific framework of biblically rooted pastoral activity in mind. In constructing anything approaching a biblically framed definition of this pastoral activity, I believe we must start with several very basic texts of Scripture which focus upon the tasks of an elder generically. And only when we place this activity within the orbit of that generic biblical perspective of the functions of an elder will we have a biblically rooted understanding of this activity of pastoral counseling. I believe this is absolutely critical and that for two basic reasons. Number one, it is only by defining this pastoral activity in the light of the Word of God that the mystique of counseling will be both exposed and, I hope, jettisoned. The whole idea that an effective pastoral counselor must be some kind of a mind reader, a super psychologist, knowledgeable in all the latest pronouncements of the psychiatric and psychological gurus, and a host of other things, hopefully will be killed and buried deeply, and that we pour concrete over the grave. That's my intention by seeking to labor from the scriptures to find a biblically rooted definition of this activity. In the second place, it is only within the framework of seeing our labors in pastoral counseling as an aspect of a ministry of the new covenant that we will be prepared both to seek and to expect the special help of the Holy Spirit promised to every minister of the new covenant engaged in a new covenant ministry. And I refer especially to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 6, where the apostle is in this section contrasting the old and the new covenants. He writes, And such confidence we have through Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to account anything as from ourselves, but, and here's his confidence, our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Our enablement for New Covenant ministry comes from the crowning gift of New Covenant blessings, even the gift of the Holy Spirit and His peculiarly promised help and assistance in those labors that are part and parcel of that New Covenant ministry. Furthermore, in Acts 20, 28, and then in 1 Peter 5, 2, Elders are charged with a solemn responsibility to, quote, shepherd the flock of God. There is the verbal use of the poimain word, which is shepherd, and poimaino means to fulfill the functions and roles of a shepherd to sheep. In his excellent book entitled Shepherd Leader, Timothy Whitmer suggests that the solemn charge to shepherd God's people means, at a minimum, four things. We are to know them, we are to feed them, we are to lead them, and to protect them. In pastoral counseling, you are doing precisely just those things. Perhaps you've discerned that one of the sheep need some personal shepherding in one of these four areas, or 
Perhaps an individual has come and acknowledged to you some specific need that demands your hands-on personal interaction and ministry as a shepherd to one of your sheep. Spiritually speaking, perhaps they have a broken bone that needs to be set. Or maybe perhaps they have a chronic spiritual stomach disorder that needs some biblical medication. Or perhaps they need help in the healing process from a recent skirmish with a wolf or with him who is described as a roaring lion who prowls about seeking whom he may devour. Or you may have discerned that they've got a growing lesion that they may not even be aware of, and you call their attention to that spiritual lesion, something that will need to be excised by spiritual surgery. But all of that is subsumed under the larger heading of shepherding the flock of God which is among you. We recognize that all authentic biblical preaching is constantly giving pastoral counsel to the people of God. However, in what we're designating as pastoral counseling, we are fulfilling our task in a more limited and specific way. Even though what we are doing may not in every case be called crisis counseling, such as we would be engaged in if there were an impending divorce, suicidal tendencies, a gross moral fall, but we are speaking of that pastoral interaction that goes beyond the counsel contained in your regular preaching and in your ordinary and regular interaction with the sheep of God. The preaching, the normal interaction, will always partake of the nature of counsel, but we're thinking in terms of this privatized interaction of the shepherd with the sheep, and we designate it as pastoral counseling. I believe it's perhaps most helpful to place our task within the framework of Paul's description of those elders who are called to labor in the word and in teaching, 1 Timothy 5, 17. While some of the principles are obviously applicable to what we would call non-professional elders, those who are laboring in office, but they are not set apart to labor full-time as they're calling in the word and in teaching. But by putting it in that category, again, I think it helps to move us and close us in to a more precise biblical definition of what pastoral counseling is. In fulfilling this task, much of your labor will be discharged in conjunction with the stated public ministries in teaching and preaching of the Word. However, when you're in your study or office or in the home of one of the sheep for a session of personal counsel, you do not suddenly become a different person in a different office with a different function. In terms of who you are, in terms of your office, in terms of your function, you are an elder laboring in the word and in doctrine. In the pulpit, in the living room, in the study. There is no radical disjuncture with respect to your calling to be one who labors in the word and in teaching. You are seeking in this activity to bring the word of God to bear upon patterns of thought and action in order to determine by the norms of Scripture whether those actions and attitudes are virtuous or vicious. Furthermore, you're seeking to bring the great indicatives and the grand imperatives of the gospel to bear upon the life and conduct of the individual with whom you are counseling. So in a very real sense, as one laboring in the word and in doctrine, 
your conscious goal is that which is articulated by the Apostle Paul in these two key texts, Colossians 1, 28 and 29, and Galatians 4 and verse 19. Colossians 1, 28 and 9. Having mentioned that the glory of his ministry is the proclamation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, Paul goes on to say, whom we proclaim, now notice, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect or mature in Christ, whereunto I labor also, and from Acts 20 we know it was labor publicly. It was labor from house to house. Public preaching and proclamation. Private, more hand-to-hand -hand spiritual combat interaction. I labor also, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. So when we sit in the study, when we sit in the living room of the sheep we are ministering to, Christ is central to our endeavor. We are proclaiming him in some facet of what that involves, admonishing every man, teaching every man in all wisdom with the end in view to present every man mature in Christ. And then in Galatians 4, and verse 19, Paul tells us what he is doing in his interaction with these Galatians who have deflected from the purity of the gospel that his great passion for them is that Christ himself would be formed in them. Galatians 4 and verse 19, my little children, of whom I am again in travail. You're giving me a second experience of spiritual birth pains by trying to help you in this present intrusion of false doctrine. My little children of whom I am in travail till Christ be formed in you. This is our function. This is our goal in pastoral counseling when placed within a thoroughly rooted biblical perspective. And therefore, in the light of these perspectives, I would offer, not as something inspired, semi-inspired, or anything in between those, or above them or below them, but a working definition of what I mean when you hear me say in these lectures, pastoral counseling, this is what I'm talking about. Pastoral counseling is a personalized dimension of shepherding the flock of God conducted as a ministry of the word in the overall context of the life and ministry of the church with a view to seeing Christ more fully formed in the one to whom we are ministering. Now I'm sure as I reflect on that and go back over it subsequent to the lectures, I will per se, oh, I wish I'd changed this word, that word, but the moment of truth comes when you gotta tell the computer what words to put in its brain and put on paper. Well, that word, that time has come and gone, so this I offer as at least if not the best, a good working definition thoroughly rooted in biblical perspectives concerning what we are about in pastoral counseling. Well, having worked on that attempt at coming to a biblically rooted definition by way of introduction in the second place, I desire to highlight a vital distinction. So we go from definition to distinction. And the distinction that we must constantly keep in view in a study of this subject is the distinction between essential precepts and principles and their non-essential variables in the outworking and application of those precepts and principles. 
One of the things that I continually emphasized when seeking to lay out biblical principles and precepts relative to effective preaching when I taught my three units on the preaching of the Word is that each preacher, each pastor brings to his preaching a rich diversity of individual gift, temperament, personality, mental furniture, and his own Christian experience. All of those things are not suspended, so when he sits at his desk to prepare, stands in his pulpit to preach, he is somehow neutered of the real influence and effect of those variables, individuality of gift, temperament, personality, mental furniture, and Christian experience. I sought to emphasize again and again that to the extent that these things do not undermine or negate the embodiment of the fundamental precepts and principles of the Word, they should find full and free expression in our actual preaching. In other words, I sought to emphasize that each man's preaching should be smothered, smothered, not just occasionally touched, but smothered with his own fingerprints. And what is true of his public preaching, because pastoral counseling is a dimension of the ministry of the Word, all of those variables will enter into the manner in which we engage in this aspect of our pastoral labor in the Word and in doctrine. In the same way as we undertake to develop skill in the pastoral labor of individual care for the sheep, no two men will approach this task. They ought not to approach the task in precisely the same way in their regular preaching as well as in their pastoral counseling. There are a host of variables that will be constantly interacting with the fundamental precepts and principles in our counseling. Furthermore, and this is vital, as with preaching, there will be growth and maturation resulting in discernible changes in the way we go about our pastoral counseling. We must not petrify the outworking of the foundational precepts and principles of a 30-year-old man, five years in the ministry, engaged in pastoral counseling, and expect that labor to look the same when he's 50 years old with 20 more years of pastoral experience. The great text that to me ought to be stamped on the wall of every preacher is 1 Timothy 4, 15. Throughout our lifetime, give yourself wholly to these things that your progress may be manifested unto all. So that when your people get together and are having fellowship and sharing how the Lord has blessed your ministry publicly and privately, those who were the beneficiaries of your ministry in your early days might say, well, this and this and this about the pastor, and they are grateful. But someone who has sat under the richer period ought to be able to say, oh, that's wonderful, but I've been far more blessed. Because I can see from what I have heard as I move among the people and as I've occasionally listened to tapes, he's a much better preacher now than when you had him in the beginning. He's a much wiser, more sensitive, tender counselor now. He's had suffering. He's had trial. He's had influences in his experience that has enriched his ability to minister tenderly, lovingly, faithfully to the sheep of God. So, by way of introduction, we've considered definition and then we've considered this vital distinction between essential principles and precepts and their outworking in our actual counseling. My third word of introduction will be comprised of answering 
what would have been in the days of the academy, maybe not so much with you men, an obvious question. When this course was being contemplated as part of the curriculum in the Trinity Ministerial Academy, as elders, we wrestled with this question. Should we bring in a recognized expert in this field, or should we attempt to handle it by our existing personnel? And as we wrestled with this question, we came to the conviction that at that time, it would not be expedient to bring in an expert. And there were two basic reasons for our decision. As I look back and try to reconstruct the history, I believe this is an accurate statement as to why we came to the decision we did. First one, very practical, the problem of availability. Such men are usually in great demand with schedules that stretch out two to three years ahead of them. And we wondered if any of those men would have been willing on a much shorter notice to come with a little handful of men down in the basement of this building to this little nondescript place called Trinity Ministerial Academy. And maybe some of that was an attempt to save being embarrassed. But anyway, I don't recall that was part of the motive, but it could well have been. It was the problem of availability, but then far more substantive, the problem of compatibility. While some of the men who were recognized at that time as experts, and their number has multiplied exponentially for good or for evil, but at that time, some of the men who would have been recognized as experts had pastoral experience, but most of them were not presently engaged in pastoral ministry or had for some years not been engaged, and their ministry had been so focused upon the matter of pastoral counseling that we wondered if there would be true compatibility with the perspectives we desired to convey to the men who were being prepared for pastoral labors. So that simply answers an obvious question. Why am I standing here giving you what I gave to people in the academy? That's the answer. My fourth and final word of introduction has to do with giving a brief explanation concerning the actual content of the lectures you will be hearing. In the ongoing development of this course, Pastor Greg Nichols, now one of the elders at Grace Emanuel Baptist Church in Grand Rapids, was an elder here at Trinity. He taught systematic theology. I was teaching pastoral theology. Given the fact that our backgrounds and our experience in life were so different, he was a converted hippie, a hedonist by his own admission. I had had the privilege of the nurture of a Christian home and all that goes with it, being brought up at least under broad evangelicalism. And we made the judgment that given that diversity of the influences that had formed us, the biblical principles that we had to rely upon to come to some degree of spiritual maturity and being equipped for ministry, plus the differing field of our, quote, expertise, mine in pastoral theology, his in systematic theology, the judgment was made by the elders that he and I should team teach the course and those aspects where theological precision were more appropriate, he would take, and those that were more weighted with pastoral insight and experience, I would teach. So we team taught the course, I believe, for a couple of times, but when he removed to Grand Rapids in 1992, subsequent to his move to Grand Rapids, I taught the course two more times before the last time in 1998. And I incorporated into my lectures 
many of the insights that were formerly covered by Pastor Nichols when the two of us were team teaching the course. I took copious notes as I sat with the students from those notes when I came to those sections the next cycle, every four years we cycled through the curriculum in pastoral theology, and I don't know precisely what parts were primarily his work and what parts were primarily mine. I have a suspicion uh, what those are, but I can't precisely, so I freely acknowledge my indebtedness for his contribution to the stuff that I will be seeking to convey. I've made it mine, however much I first received it from him. I've sought to be persuaded out of the scriptures that these were indeed the truths of the living God. So much then for that lengthy introduction, but I felt those issues were vital as we spread the table and now draw up our chairs to the table to what we are entitling as unit number one, an overview of pastoral counseling. And we begin in this overview by addressing the necessity for pastoral counseling. If you are to be a man who is fulfilling his calling primarily as one set apart to labor in the word and in teaching, but to a great degree in any function as a biblical elder, I say the necessity for pastoral counseling is rooted in three things. Number one, the biblical description of the duties of the pastoral office and function demands it. The biblical description of the duties of the pastoral office and function demands it. Ephesians 4, that watershed text with respect to where pastors and teachers come from and why they are given by the ascended Christ, we read the following. He that descended, the same is he that ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints unto the work of service or the work of ministering unto the building up of the body of Christ. And in this passage, there is a most wonderful integration of the unique and needed ministry of specially gifted, specially recognized servants of God in the church. It was not the thought of ambition, lay, ambitious laymen to come up with the idea of the pastoral office. It was Christ himself who looks upon that bride that he purchased with his own blood, and he says, until the consummation, when I, the great shepherd, will have them all gathered about me forever, they need pastor teachers in order to be perfected and equipped for their spiritual function. But then he goes on to speak of that which every joint supplies and has a beautiful integration of mutual body ministry in the context of the specialized ministry of pastors and teachers. So if we are given to the church for the equipping of the people of God for whatever service work God has appointed for them, and they need our input, our input at specific points of spiritual perplexity, problems with certain sins that are impeding their growth, we observe things about them and in them that are contradictory of their ongoing growth and perfection into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, we then have an obligation to engage them one-on-one, -on -one, or if it's a marriage that is obviously troubled, engage that couple to the end that we might fulfill our Christ given responsibility of ministering to the saints. 
And then, of course, Acts 20 and verse 28, where Paul, having charged the Ephesian elders to shepherd the flock, all the flock, into which the Holy Spirit is made, you bishops, to shepherd the church of the Lord that he purchased with his blood, Paul, who has been able to set forth his own ministry as an example of a true shepherd, could then go on to say in verse 31, Therefore watch, remembering that by the space of three years I ceased not to admonish every one night and day with tears, so that every one within the flock is to be shepherded, and when it is evident that the sheep needs the hands-on individual attention of the shepherd, part of the responsibility laid upon us is to exercise that privilege. And then the text we've already looked at, the Colossians 1 passage, where the apostle speaks of admonishing and teaching every man in all wisdom, whom we proclaim admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. And I think it is both an exegetical and an existential impossibility to say that that kind of specificity can be fulfilled simply by the public ministry of the Word of God. If we are to stand and say, we have every man, there ought to be a lot of every individual men and women and say, yes, that's the kind of shepherd you've been to me, showing individual personal care of my spiritual well-being. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10, we have a similar emphasis, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Verses 9 and 10. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, working night and day that we might not burden any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holily, righteously and unblameably we behaved ourselves toward you that believe, now our text, as you know how we dealt with each one of you as a father with his own children, exhorting you, encouraging you, and testifying to the end you should walk worthily of God who calls you unto his own kingdom and glory. Now a good, a wise, and a godly father can organize family powwows where all the kids are gathered around the table with the wife at his side and he's got directions to give, he's got corrections to make, but no wise and good father deals with his family en masse and en toto. He will not only have family powwows, there are times when he will say, as my mom and dad would say, and I'm one of ten children. So there was a lot of hands-on parenting done when dad would come home from work at night. Some would say, the psychologists would say, this is horrible psychology, but I bless God for their horrible psychology. My mother popping out a child about every two years, so she was either big with child or nursing a child, and the kind of hands-on spankings that might be needed for given actions, it was often difficult for her to administer, especially as we got older. But we knew if we deserved it, and she did not administer it, it was not negated. The sentence still hung over our head. So when we would come to the table, and I can relive it even on this, my 78th birthday, Dad sat here, Mom sat there. And sooner or later, dad would turn to mom and say, well, dear, how have the children been today? And now the guillotine dropped. (laughs) You knew, well, Joyce has been very compliant, dad, and done this and this and this. I was sunny till I was 19. 
But if Sonny had done something worthy of discipline, I knew when supper was over, all right, son, upstairs to the bathroom. And we had this ritual. I still can't quite figure it all out. While Dad locked the door, I had to pull down the shade. <laughs> As I say, I don't have a clue what was behind this ritual. And my father's hand, he had a ham hand. And when he brought that thing down on my backside, it made it worthwhile not to do again what I had done to precipitate that hand on my bottom. And I bless God for that. But it was that individual, hands-on, or when they saw a pattern that concerned them, and with that house full of kids in a small home, they would say to one of us as we got older, after everyone's gone to bed, son, mom and dad need to speak to you. Well, I knew here was going to be some hands-on, individual, pointed, parental pressure brought to bear upon Sonny before he crawled under the sheets. Now, it's that kind of thing Paul's talking about. As a father, a wise father, a compassionate father, he was proactive in his interaction with these Thessalonian believers. And so I am saying that we, as God's servants, must recognize that the biblical description of our duties demands this activity. And then the final passage, 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, when Paul is giving the requirements for an elder in character and in gift, he says these very pointed words, 1 Timothy 3, 4, and 5, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity, but if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? And so a well-ruled home is a home where there is not just corporate directives given by daddy, but he deals with each of the members of that household, hands-on, personal, and with principled effort to see them be brought to useful adult maturity. So, reason number one, underscoring the necessity for pastoral counseling. And here I give you the quote of Calvin and of Bridges. Calvin writes, based on Acts 20, publicly and from house to house. This is the second point, that he taught not only all in the assembly, but individuals in their homes, as each man's need demanded. For Christ did not ordain pastors on the principle that they only teach the church in a general way on the public platform, but that they also care for the individual sheep, bring back the wandering and the scattered to the fold, bind up those that are broken and crippled, Heal the sick, support the frail and weak, Ezekiel 34, 2 and 4. For general teaching often will have a cold reception unless it is helped by advice given in private. Accordingly, there is no excuse for the negligence of those who, after holding one meeting, live for the rest of their time free from care as if they have discharged their duty. It is as if their voices were shut up in the sanctuary, since they become completely dumb as soon as they come out of it. Those who learn are also warned that if they do indeed wish to be counted among the flock of Christ, they must admit the pastors as often as they come to them, and that private warnings are not to be avoided. For those who do not think fit to hear the pastor's voice except in the church building and moreover cannot bear to be warned and reproved at home, no, and fiercely reject such a necessary function into the bargain are bears rather than sheep. So Calvin says, pastors are to give individual care. The sheep are to welcome their individual care to demonstrate that they are sheep and not bears.
bears. It works both ways, and that's why I have in my definition placed this particular pastoral duty in the context of church membership. This is what Calvin is doing when he emphasizes this. And then you can read at your leisure uh, the quote from Bridges on the Christian ministry, which is fundamentally sort of an addendum to Calvin's statement, but much along the same line. Now, secondly, the necessity for pastoral counseling not only arises from the fact that the biblical description of our office and function demands it, but secondly, the inevitable results of effective pastoral preaching will precipitate it. Three of the eight units in this pastoral theology course have dealt with the subject of effective biblical preaching by the man of God in the pastoral office. And in those lectures, I sought to underscore the fact that our proclamation, explanation, and application of the Word of God must aim at the hearts and consciences of our hearers. And if we're doing this, our preaching will be opening up issues concerning which our people will need some personal pastoral interaction and counsel. Mark it down as a certain principle that he who paves a way into the hearts of his people by solid instruction, close application, with evident compassion and earnestness, has also paved a path to his study door with needy sheep seeking individual attention and spiritual help. The confidence you earn by a solid, substantive, passionate, warm, loving, pulpit ministry, that kind of a ministry inevitably will pave a path to your study door. As people gain confidence, the preacher really loves us. I can count on him to tell us the truth. He comes to a difficult passage. He acknowledges, brethren, there's a sense in which I wish God didn't say this and that I didn't have to preach it, but I'm called to preach the word. I'm under constraints by divine commission. Preach the word. And as you engage in a faithful pulpit ministry, you are paving a path into the affections and confidence and esteem of your people, while at the same time paving a path to your study door. The probing preaching will open up issues in their conscience they never thought about. And they're lost at, how in the world do I extricate myself? This is a pattern I learned from childhood. This is a pattern exemplified in my mom and dad. And now my conscience is awake to the fact I've got to change. I'm 38 years old. How in the world do I change? Pastor, can you help me? This is what I'm talking about, brethren. A true biblical ministry will precipitate the necessity of hands-on pastoral counseling. And then thirdly, the peculiar circumstances of our culture at this time intensifies the need for pastoral counseling. Sin is always present in all places at all times. In a similar way, measures of common grace are always present in all places to some degree except in hell. Now, if we really believe that, then we will seek to analyze what's going on in our present cultural situation in terms of how much, quote, common grace is yet in the stock of current society. For the scripture teaches us there are situations when aggravated expressions of sin and rebellion against God crop out in whole societies and greatly reduce the stock of the influence of common grace. Paul could say that 
of the culture at Crete. And so he says to Titus in Titus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, Titus chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, one of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, idle gluttons. This testimony is true, for which cause reprove them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. There was a degenerative influence in Cretan culture which greatly evacuated the culture where common grace will cause people to at least have a semblance of honesty in their interactions with one another or be diligent in their work. But when that stock of common grace is reduced, it's going to have a marked influence upon the necessity of pastoral counseling. And then, of course, that whole horrible sequel opened up in Romans 1, 18 to 32, when God hands men over to the lust of their hearts, and then the stock of common grace is removed and evacuated from a society. And Paul predicts that such epochs will come between the two great events of the first and second coming of Christ 2 Timothy 3.1, But know this, that in the last days grievous times shall come. There will be periods when there will be this aggravated outcropping of men being lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, implacable, slanderers, etc., etc., and one of the most painful things for old people like me is that we've had to witness this thing going on before our very eyes. To have lived through periods where as a child and as a young man, if a group of us were hanging around in a, at a local park near the Long Island shore where we lived, and if we were just hanging out or playing a ball game or something, if we saw a policeman came by, we all said, Chicky, the cops. It comes back to me very vividly. We weren't doing anything wrong. But we had this sense of holy dread of the policeman. This is the law. We just had better double check and make sure we're not doing anything to cause that policeman to stop his car and get out and walk toward us. Then to have lived to see people throwing handfuls of human excrement in the face of policemen. The shock of it, I can still relive it when I saw that go on in the 60s. And the language, the foul, filthy cursing and, and vile language used toward those in authority. To see little children running around in supermarkets absolutely ungoverned and the parents not even embarrassed about it. That's all been part of a massive, seismic cultural shift that I have lived to see in my brief lifetime. And it's been especially since the Second World War, this cultural shift that has radically depleted whatever stock of common grace was still patent in the overall culture of our country. Again, the whole Vietnam War. I lived through the Second World War. I remember the day Pearl Harbor occurred and seeing my sister sit on my dad's knee, looking through a window from our porch. She was crying and she asked my dad, Daddy, are we going to be bombed? And my dad was seeking to comfort her. And when we heard Roosevelt's speech, this they will live on in infamy. We said, yes, we're at war. We walked down the street. We looked for gum wrappers. We peeled off the tinfoil and we began to form a ball. And those balls would be put in receptacles. And we knew they were going to the war effort. 
there was a sense that throbbed through the entirety of society. We're in this together. This is a life and death struggle. And children, young people, felt that reality. And then to have seen what happened and the terrible fracturing of society. Well, brethren, those things were expressions previous to such time of common grace, common grace that brought blessing even to the unconverted and restrained evil. But it is the peculiar circumstances of our culture at this time that intensifies the need for pastoral counseling, for many things that enable people to live structured, disciplined, responsible, productive lives, you absorbed from the climate of the culture. And when it's no longer there to be absorbed and God saves people and brings them into your church, you've got to start by teaching them how to change their diapers. You've got to start by teaching them how to bring the spoon to their mouth and not their ear. And in some of the most elementary things, people need passionate, loving, patient, hands-on pastoral interaction if they're going to come to useful maturity in Christ. Add to that the influences that have come in upon us, the scourge of no-fault divorce, the erosion of family structures, the proliferation of humanistic relativism, the accumulated influence of three generations raised on evolutionary theory, the intrusion of the drug culture, the advance of the welfare state, the brainwashing and molding influence of TV and the internet, and all of the other technological advances, so many of which fragment a society, cut people off from one another, draw them into addictive immersion into what is vile and filthy or banal and useless. All of those influences, brethren, have bled out the common grace that once was part and parcel of our society. And the effects of this will of necessity demand that under God you be an instrument in His hands to seek to bring such people to maturity in Christ. And if you've come where I've come from, your greatest temptation at times, and you've not, you're not old enough, but if you did, I'm just honestly confessing, there are times you just say, come off it, grow up. Not so simple. You don't know what it means to grow up and what you'll look like if you're grown up. And you've got to teach people. And God help us men, since this is the setting in which God has placed us, that when we are done our ministries, it can be said of us, as was said of David in Acts chapter 12, 13 and verse 36. Acts 13 and verse 36. For David, after he had in his own generation served the counsel of God, fell asleep, and was laid unto his fathers. He served the counsel of God in his own generation. God's put you in this generation. He's lets me hang around in this generation, much to the consternation of my soul, having known many things that you only know by report, but they were part and parcel of my conscious experience. But man, he's called you to serve him in this generation and in this generation to engage in the kind of pastoral ministry, including pastoral counseling biblically rooted and biblically shaped to bring people to maturity in Christ. Now then, I want to address in the second place the proper place or the relative priority of pastoral counseling. 
We've considered a definition and then we have addressed the necessity for and now the proper place or relative priority of pastoral counseling. One is quaintly but wisely said, and it was said to me as a young believer, if the devil cannot freeze us out of doing our duty, he will seek to burn us up in the excessive performance of our duty. I don't know who the old man was that put that in my 18-year-old ear, but it's lived with me now for 60 years. If the devil cannot freeze us out of doing our duty, he'll seek to burn us up in the excessive performance of our duty. So in the light of this principle and in the light of the tremendous need of pastoral counseling derived from the things we've already covered, you and I must have some fixed guidelines with reference to the place we will give to pastoral counseling in relationship to our other manifold ministerial and pastoral duties as I've already considered those in our previous lectures. Let me attempt to give these guidelines in the form of four axioms. An axiom is a fixed principle or rule. The application of, the, of these axioms will differ in each one of your lives, but I believe the axioms are critical. What are they? Number one, axiom number one, as a general rule, you must not allow the demands of pastoral counseling to erode the disciplines essential to consistent, solid, fruitful public teaching and preaching of the Word of God. And the key words in that axiom are, as a general rule, if you've blocked out in your work week Thursday and Friday for specific concentrated preparation for the Lord's Day, and you get a call Thursday at 11 o'clock, right at the time when you feel you've begun to break the back of the meaning of the text, the thematic emphasis of the text, that one of your sheep is being rushed to the hospital with cardiac problems, you don't say, well, Lord, today's the day of sermon preparation. I'll go at a more convenient time. No, that's the way to alienate your people and to give the impression you're unconcerned, even if you fell to your knees and prayed for half an hour. That's the time you've got to break into your normal schedule in conjunction with preparing well-thought-out, exegetically accurate, well-structured, well-illustrated, properly applied sermons, and say, in the car, bucko, go to the hospital, minister to the family, minister to the afflicted saints. So when I say, as a general rule, that's what I'm talking about. You must not allow the demands of pastoral counseling to erode the disciplines essential to consistent, solid, fruitful public teaching and preaching. Suppose someone should call you at 11 o'clock on that Thursday and say, Pastor, I need a session of counseling and I need it right away. Well, excuse me, ma'am, I'm in the midst of sermon preparation, and if the issues are critical, I'm ready to lay this aside. What is your problem? And lo and behold, there's absolutely no immediate necessity. It's just someone who was brought up in a context of immediate gratification of all her needs, and she thinks you're going to bow before the fact that she thinks she needs a pastoral counseling session ASAP. That, see, then that's not a necessary intrusion into your preparation. And then another key phrase in my axiom is fruitful ministry of the word. If the people have reason to think you are detached and unresponsive to crisis situations, nothing whatsoever can cut into your marked out preparation time you are cutting off their ears by bits and pieces. No matter how much your sermon may be polished and solidly biblical, if the people don't give you their ears, you might as well be talking 
out the back door to the local deer that come into your backyard here in New Jersey. The enemies of these disciplines essential to such a ministry can be found both in you and in your people. In you, in that there's there's a desire in all of us to control others, to feel that they are dependent upon our almighty wisdom and insight. And you can very easily feed that unmortified lust that is in the human heart. And also, sometimes counseling one of the sheep is so much easier than the exercise of hard discipline study that we almost welcome a call for a pastoral counseling session. So brethren, be aware of that and as a general rule, do not allow the demands for this counseling ministry to erode the disciplines necessary for fruitful preaching. And then I've given you a text and then a quote. And the text is Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Very vital text in conjunction with this issue. Ephesians 5, verses 15 to 17. Look therefore carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not Foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And we need to remind ourselves that that's our God-given responsibility to wisely apportion our time in discharging our ministerial labors. And then Bishop Ryle, in his marvelous little book, 18th Century Leaders, which is a veritable gold mine of stuff for preachers as he gives these mini biographies and vignettes of some of the great leaders. Writing concerning William Romaine, he says this, he was not perhaps what could be called nowadays a genial man. He was naturally close and reserved, says Cadogan, who must have been one of his official biographers, quoting Cadogan, irritable to a certain degree, short and quick in his replies, and frequently mistaken as being rude and morose when he meant nothing of the kind. Had he paid more attention than he did to the various distresses of soul and body that were brought before him, he would have had no time left for reading, meditation, prayer, and in short, for what every man must attend to in private who would be useful in public. It was not uncommon for him to tell those who came to him with cases of conscience and questions of spiritual concern that he said all he had to say in the pulpit. Thus the people might be hurt for the moment by such a dismissal, but they had only to attend his preaching and they soon found their difficulties had impressed him as well as themselves that they had been submitted to God and that they had been the subject of his serious and affectionate consideration. And their counsel came out in the preaching without any personal embarrassment. Now I only cite that because it highlights, I'm not saying follow that pattern, but it highlights this fact, our conviction of what is necessary for long-term fruitful preaching with respect to those disciplines of general reading, specific preparation, and all of those things that flow into a growingly fruitful public preaching ministry, we must never allow pastoral counseling to undermine those disciplines as a pattern of life. Now very quickly, axiom number two, do not allow the demands of pastoral counseling with people who have chronic problems to erode the time available for positive, constructive pastoral influence with others. I had to learn this the hard way. Some people had chronic problems 
that took away time that could have been invested with people who were growing in grace and who with one of the hours spent with the chronically sick sheep would have made tremendous progress in grace. And there can be a situation develop where people with these chronic problems can gobble up the time allocated for pastoral counseling. We need to face the fact that the Word of God indicates that certain ethical and moral patterns bring with them specific negative results which the grace of God does not necessarily change. Granted, there's a biblical doctrine of restorative grace. Joel 2.25, I will restore the years that the locust has eaten, that the canker worm has eaten. However, some people will go through life crippled and maimed for the rest of their earthly pilgrimage because of certain sins they have committed, duties and disciplines omitted. Ten of the best counselors in the world could never sort out the wretched fruits that came from David's lust and murder. God himself said, your house is going to be a house divided and trouble will dog you to the end of your days. And there's no indication that Nathan spent a lot of time in pastoral counseling trying to change those realities. And so without being fatalistic, we need to pray to God for discernment that we don't have our time swallowed up with people who have chronic problems that will not most likely be changed in this life. Let me illustrate. Imagine a village where many of the population are sickly because of a bad water supply and polluted air. One could spend all his time giving first aid to those whose illnesses are rooted in that twofold condition, polluted water supply and bad air. Or one could bend his efforts to address the problem of the bad water and the polluted air. So in a very real sense, we are engaged in both activities continually and we need wisdom to know how to apportion our time. There are times when we need to put band-aids on people. There are times we need to spend hours calculating what can be done to get the air purified and to get the water source purified. And so I give you that axiom in the light of those realities. Axiom number three, do not allow the current ministerial trends and fads to dictate your practice and emphasis upon pastoral counseling. We must be like the men of Issachar described in 1 Chronicles 12.32 who had wisdom to know what they ought to do. I would suggest that this present strong emphasis on the necessity for pastors to engage in considerable pastoral counseling arises from three sources. Number one, this emphasis has been nurtured in the climate in which biblical preaching has been at a low ebb. When I say biblical preaching has been at a low ebb, I mean both a biblical view of the centrality, nature, and uniqueness of preaching in the purpose of God and a high standard of spirit-empowered biblical preaching itself. Where there is confidence in and power resting upon real biblical preaching, there is exerted continually both a therapeutic, formative, and prophylactic influence upon your hearers. Where such preaching and its influence has been absent, we see the tragic results and can be tempted to concentrate upon treating the symptoms that come from that absence and fail to address the cause. The mess people are in is because they've been deprived of true, solid, spirit-empowered biblical preaching. Well, let's go after the cause and not spend all our time 
trying to mop up the mess of the fruits that arise from that cause. There's a real parallel between this reality and the emphasis upon follow-up ministry in modern evangelistic campaigns. Shallow, cheap, unbiblical evangelism produces decisions. And all these people who've decided for Christ drop off one by one. We need better follow-up. No, you don't need better follow-up. You need better start-up. <laughs> You've got to go back to the cause of the necessity for involved in complex follow-up. That is a biblical view of conversion and biblical preaching calculated under God's blessing to produce conversion. And then I say, secondly, the present emphasis upon pastoral counseling has been nurtured in the context of the judgment of God upon a God-rejecting society. A cursory reading of Romans 1 clearly indicates a relationship between the rejection of light and the emergence of sinful social patterns in society. And as I reflect upon this, if all that horrible litany of sins flows out from the rejection of general revelation, what will flow out from the rejection of special revelation? And from that standpoint, rather than calling our nation a pagan nation, I think it's more accurate with apostrophes to call it an apostate nation. When you think of all of the gospel light of special revelation that has beamed across our nation in its history, if merely rejecting what can be known of God, looking at the heavens and the stars and looking at our own conscience can bring on that horrible list of wretched sins in Romans 1, we should not be surprised that we're seeing a list that makes that look like kid stuff. That being so, brethren, there's going to be tremendous, tremendous pressure upon you to try to patch it all up. And so what significance should this have as we consider the place of pastoral counseling in our own labors? Well, I answer with three simple principles. Number one, give the preaching of the gospel its proper place in such a setting. You see... What precipitates Romans 1, 18 and following is Paul's marvelous affirmation. I want to come to Rome, and I want to come to Rome to preach the gospel, because I'm confident the gospel's the power of God unto salvation, a salvation that can take people enmeshed in the very sins I'm going to describe that bring the wrath of God upon them and it changes them from the inside out. So brethren, rather than throw up our hands, say, what in the world can we do? What we can do is preach the gospel and cry to God that we will preach it more powerfully and more earnestly that we might see God's gracious work transforming men in marvelous ways. That's my first word of admonition. Give the preaching of the gospel its proper place. Secondly, is a word of counsel. Seek to discover those men and women in the congregation who are competent to help some of these struggling people in areas where you do not need to bring your expertise to bear. You've got people who have no sense of fiscal responsibility. Now, perhaps you do. I hope you do. But you've also got some people in your church who do. Don't you spend counseling time in the area of how to attain fiscal responsibility, setting up a budget. Find those people in your church and say, God's given you special help in this area. Cultivate that gift. Then you refer that person, says, Pastor, I need counseling. My finances are in a mess. And you say, well, I have wonderful news for you. Your dear sister and brother, John and Mary Jones, have been exemplary. They have a warm, open heart. They will gladly sit down with you and refer them out. Someone else doesn't have a clue how to manage little kids. They don't know when to laugh, when to spank, when to stroke, when to comfort 
You've got well-established families who know how to handle. You say, look, I've got good news for you. I want you to arrange to go in and spend a couple of evenings and I'll speak to them for you. And you just observe. See how they handle their little Johnny and their little Mary. See how they relate to their children. Then begin to gather your questions and then I will urge them to encourage you to set up some times to sit down and talk and articulate specifically what they have done and why they have done it and what scriptures have shaped them. That's Ephesians 4. Pastors and teachers with their distinctive contribution, every joint supplying as well to the well-being of the body. So I would urge you by that word of counsel to make good use of the people within the assembly. And then the third is a word of simple observation, and it is this, that the current emphasis on pastoral counseling tends to make a man feel incompetent unless he has had specialized training in this area. Now, no rational man would deny the fact that the wisest and the most experienced and most highly trained specialists are at times necessary to help us handle a difficult counseling situation. However, brethren, as we'll see more fully in the next lecture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 means something. And when it says God breathed scripture is not only sufficient to teach the way of salvation, but to make the man of God competent and complete unto every good work. That means we need not be intimidated because we've not had specialized training. Furthermore, skipping over a couple of the other texts, if the head of the church has called and equipped you to be a pastor teacher, then armed with the word of God, in dependence upon the Spirit of God, with a heart suffused by the love of God, you will be able by the grace of God to fulfill your duties as a shepherd who needs to attend to a needy sheep. As part of your general reading program, include periodically books addressing the subject written by men who have proven biblical insights and practical experience in this field of gospel endeavor. And then quickly and finally, axiom number four, do not forget that as in all other aspects of ministerial function, there will be a great diversity of aptitude and extent of usefulness in the field of pastoral counseling. And I've listed the text, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7, Romans 12, 6 to 8, as surely as all elders must be apt to teach, but there is a broad spectrum of legitimate expression of that requirement, so it is with aptitude in pastoral counseling, and the onus is on us and on our people to make sober self-assessment of the present measure and development of our gift for this pastoral endeavor. Well, I got through what I had hoped to, and you have been very patient and shown great endurance to hang in there for this lengthy opening lecture, but I figure if you can't hang in with me early in the morning, then I'm undone by the time we come to the afternoon. Let's thank God for his help in our time together. Father, we are so thankful that we have been able to begin to wrestle with this vast area of pastoral duty with the confidence that your word is indeed the sufficient guide and rule of all of our faith and our practice. We pray you will bless to the heart of each of the men the things we've considered together and may they bear abundance of good fruit in the days to come to the praise of your grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.